Both Derek and myself, we are going to be doing a joint presentation. I will first start by doing like a more high level overview about the program itself. And then Derek will take over and I will help um, advance the slides. And Derek will be focusing more on the sort of mentor recruitment, support and reward strategies. Uh, today, we both represent Open Education for the Better World program. Uh, I have been involved in like a number of years as a, as a hub coordinator and also as a member of the advisory board. Derek has been involved as a mentor for several years, uh, but in my day-to-day -day job, I work as a director of operations for Open Education Global, and that's a global organization supporting and advancing openness in education worldwide. All right, so Open Education for a Better World um, was established in 2018 uh, with two primary goals in mind. First was to address uh, the capacity development needs in the development, reuse, and adaptation of open educational resources, or shortly OER. And the second objective was to provide expert guidance or support to project leaders in the development of resources uh, that have got social impact and that are related to one or more sustainable development goals. And if I say like development of resources, I should say that all of them have to be made available as open educational resources. Right? So that means typically uh, being licensed under Creative Commons licenses. To be honest, um, all of the projects are actually related to a sustainable development goal number four, which is about quality education. But several project leaders are also focusing on other sustainable development goals. More specifically, this could be sustainable development goal 11, which is about sustainable cities and communities, or 13, which is related to climate change, or 16, which is peace and justice. The program itself is organized in yearly cycles. And so the way that it works is uh, in October and November each year, we launch a call for applications. Uh, so that includes both for projects and also for mentors. Then uh, we review uh, the applications themselves. Uh, and if they are accepted, they are allocated into different hubs. Uh, these hubs could be both geographical and topical, um, but I'm gonna say more about it a bit later. And uh, then the project leaders are matched with, pro, uh, with mentors. And this typically happens around the December, early January timeframe. And then once that is uh, concluded, then the actual project cycle starts, uh, which is from January to June each year or over a period of six months. And then concurrently with, the, with this period uh, from January to June, we also have additional capacity development activities in the form of webinars that are both for project uh, leaders and also for mentors. Uh, you can see those links there uh, and I, probably I should share those links after the presentation in the, in the Google document because I'm not sure if you can access them right now. And um, then each year the program culminates with a final event during which project leaders have the opportunity to present the outputs from the respective initiatives and get additional feedback, uh, but also to participate in additional training opportunities. And this happens during the July, October timeframe. It's either in person, situation permitting, and it happens in Slovenia, in Vipava, Slovenia, uh, or online. And so obviously in 2019, the transition into fully online mode. Uh, since, it is set, since its inception in 2018, uh, there have been four cohorts, uh, all together with 215 projects, 221 mentors, and 11 plus hub coordinators. This uh, then cumulatively, cover, cumulatively covers uh, over 40 countries around the world. And I should also mention that participation here for all stakeholders is, is voluntary. So that means project leaders, mentors, hub coordinators, and also the initiators. This slide gives you an idea about the geographical spread of projects that were accepted initially into this program uh, this year. And I say initially, uh, because it was 104 initially, there has been some attrition since for different reasons. Uh, to be honest with you, a lot of that has got to do with COVID. Um, so people or other sort of work health related reasons, uh, but this was the initial picture. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, there is a lot of interest uh, in projects uh, from Asia in particular, and actually from India in particular, and this happens on a yearly basis. Uh, but we do have a nice geographical spread of projects from around the world, actually, but we would like to encourage more participation from other regions that are currently, or countries that are currently somewhat underrepresented. And this is hopefully going to be achieved through a significantly expanded advisory board that was done earlier this year. There's gonna have 36 members in different parts of the world whose role is to also, amongst other things, encourage participation from those regions or countries around the world. 
Earlier, I mentioned the idea of hubs. And so just to clarify what that actually is. Uh, so when the program started in 2018, uh, there was like a short, like a small number of projects. But as the program grew the, in the next year, um, the hubs were introduced to actually help manage the growing numbers of projects pretty much, right? So it was not just up to the initiators from Slovenia or the organizers of the programs themselves, but they actually needed additional manpower to help manage those projects. And so when, it, uh, when those hubs were introduced in 2009, uh, sorry, 2019, there were initially only three hubs, geographical hubs, which was the North and South America hub, Africa, Europe hub, and the hub Asia. And then in 2020 and 2021, these hubs were then further enriched with uh, what we call topical hubs. All right? So you can see the different topics uh, that these, those projects are grouped into. And these are basically groupings of projects that work on common uh, uh, topical areas. Right? Um, and each hub has got a hub coordinator. In, more, in some cases, more than one hub coordinator. It really depends on the number of projects that are allocated into those hubs. So I mentioned that I'm a hub coordinator for Africa and Europe, for example, in this instance. And our role is multi, multi-fold, I would say. So we help with the, the entire process. So basically, when it comes to the allocation of projects into specific hubs, um, the, the matching with mentors, the, the initial communication with mentors, whether they accept or reject the assignment, and then the initial introductions between mentors and the project leaders, uh, we initiate the first round of calls, and then uh, continue tracking progress on those or developments with these projects every four to six weeks. Uh, we then also provide additional support as needed or required, and then also help to shape the final event, um, the agenda for the final event during which project leaders present the outputs uh, from the respective initiatives. Here is a bit of a snapshot of projects that were developed in 2020. Again, there is a very wide variety of topics that project leaders are working on. If you want to get a bit more idea, you can just visit the website and just peruse those projects individually. Um, and in terms of the kinds of resources uh, that project leaders are also working on, it also varies. Some people are working on full courses um, that they then implement within their respective um, institutions or you know, within their specific target audience. Some people are working on openly licensed textbooks, for example, or some other standalone resources or guidelines. Um, so it really varies. And here I would just like to give you an example of one of the final events that happened in 2019 in Vipava, Slovenia. So that was still pre-COVID times when we could actually meet in uh, person. And uh, during this specific event, uh, there were selected group of project leaders um, who came to Slovenia to present their outputs. There were also some mentors who were present and Derek here was one of them actually. And he was doing a presentation on one of the project leaders who was not able to be there at the time. Uh, this year, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are probably going to uh, have a blend of approaches uh, as far as the final event is concerned. So there's going to be some online component and, and hopefully some in-person component uh, that would coincide with Open Education Global Conference in early October in Nantes, France. And now I would like to hand over to Derek to continue with the mentor, mentor recruitment support and reward strategies. Thanks, Igor. Um so I'd like to talk a bit about how uh, mentors are recruited and, and, and selected. Um, at present, I don't know of any formal education program that teaches people how to create open education uh, in an interdisciplinary or holistic manner. But we do know of many organizations and people who are committed to the cause of widening access to education. And many of these people are motivated by public good and not profit. And they're from an education background. And because they're from an education background, they have been exposed to some kind of mentorship before because mentorship is key to the way that educationalists get taught. So the way OE, Educa open Education for a Better World, or OE4BW puts it, is they call four mentors, as Igor said, in about October or November. And then there is a mentor that is allocated to a mentee based on skills and expertise of mentors and mentees, as well as time zones, and as, as well as the topics that they're going to be 
cover, covering. Um, the hub coordinators are the people who are allocated to take responsibility for this matching and they do the introductions and they check in and they also are useful for advice. Uh, as a mentor, and I've been a mentor for three uh, of these of these cohorts. In the fourth one, I was actually mentored, but as, as a mentee and a mentor, I experienced and gave expert guidance. I also gave a consistent and reliable precedence for project leaders uh, and, and give them some things like 5R skills or creative common skills. I also focus on motivation, scaffolding, encouragement, and role modeling. Um, and I've been thinking a, a bit maybe a bit, more, a bit more coherently about what are some of the hats that a mentor has to wear um, in order to help them accomplish those outputs that, that Igor show, showed you. And I think it is a little more than skills. I think this is not just training. There's a, there's a need for an effective dimension of, of mentorship where you offer a friendly, non-threatening relationship with ongoing communication and interaction. You offer a managerial um, dimension where you manage the time frames, the delivery dates, uh, some of the norms and procedures. There's a cognitive element where you facilitate a growing knowledge of some of the, the um, ideas necessary to make open education a, a reality. And this often depends on local contextual issues as well. There's technical issues, systems and software, what works, what have they got access to, what they haven't. And then there is the evaluator function where we're giving ongoing feedback and a validation for the work that has, has been done. Um, this sounds like a lot, but it is not done, as I said earlier on, alone. It's done in conjunction with hub coordinators. And, and I think this hub coordinator then offers an additional layer of, I suppose, expertise to individual mentees, mentors like myself, because there's someone to consult with, someone who are seeing the bigger picture. Um, they uh, are able to uh, suggest strategies or approaches. Um, and then they're also able to um, offer, offer further, further guidance. So in, in my most recent mentorship um, situation that I've had, I was mentoring someone who wasn't able to do some of the things that we thought he would be able to do. And, and I started to feel really terrible. And it was really nice to have um, Igor's support and uh, feedback on how to approach it. And, and we, we solved the problem, but it, it wasn't just me and the, and the mentee that were in a disagreement. Um, the, the, the thing was resolved by a, a helpful and I think sympathetic third party. Igor, can you move to the next slide? So if you go to um, the website um, and if you click on the mentors link, you'll see that there are a range of different faces over there. And if you click on the people's biographies, you'll see that many of them are drawn from these three fields, academic, academic development, instructional design, or learning technology. And it's, I think these people that are drawn from these fields that have a combination of digital expertise, a predisposition to openness and education experience that makes them qualified as mentors. And I've been trying to think what motivates them as mentors. So they're all volunteers and their reward is not financial. I suspect the reward for them is actually intrinsic satisfaction. Many of these academic developers or instructional designers or learning technologists occupy roles that blur the boundaries between academia and support staff. They work in this place called the third space. And 
they are sometimes called para, para um, academics or unbounded professionals. But these mentors are comfortable with traversing typical borders that exist in institutions and they move happily across academia, admin and management. And because they have this ability in their own institutions, but they're not recognized for this ability, um, they're happy to deploy these skill sets on this program and then be recognized and acknowledged for it. So I think what keeps mentors supported and going is the fact that they are comfortable with occupying this third space. It's a place where these para-academics are recognized for their art, their skills, and their craft. Um, their presence and facilitation skills are appreciated and they don't feel they're doing it alone, but they feel like they're being supported. How am I doing on time, um, Igor? I think it's pretty much done. Okay. Um, Yo, I wanted to give an analogy to fishing, but I won't. I'll just share this later. Thanks, Igor. Okay. If you want another minute or two, um, you, you, we have started some time from you. So if you, want, if you want to wrap it up in a minute, then that you're welcome. Igor, do you want to wrap up? And I'll just share my, I think, tenuous, but it might be an interesting analogy to Yo's comment about fishing. I would just like maybe want to mention that in terms of the reward for mentors, the other upcoming strategy that we are thinking of implementing in the near future is the mentorship award for mentors. But working out the logistics around how that should happen, how the nomination process should happen, it's it's a bit complex. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know that it's something on the on the cards because this specific slide is about mentor reward. So that's all from my side. And perhaps if you want, you can still share your analogy uh, direct in a minute, and I'll just transition to the last slide. Okay, so I sometimes think that being involved as a mentor in an open education for a better world is a bit like being a member of an angling or fishing club. Becoming a good fisherman who is part of an angling club requires more than a collection of skills, although these skills are important for catching fish. Good successful fishers have more skills than casting, bait tying, etc. They have learned to think like a fish. The sum of the whole fishing experience is complex and shouldn't be broken down into disparate parts as this gives a very simplistic understanding of fishing. Learning to catch fish requires modeling by other fisher folk. These people show, rather than read the textbook or computer quiz, their matches usually happen in perches per person, but sometimes the mentorship happens around the bar where they talk about their fishing practice to other aspiring anglers. So they do it at a distance. Even the experience of not catching what they were looking for and how they exited from their errors and mistakes is important. Fluent fishermen are happy with their successes and misses because catching the fish is only a small part of the whole experience. And then finally, mentors know that they can give their fishes to others. They know that if they do that, they'll also stop the person they're teaching from being hungry for a day. But these mentors think it's far more important to induct others into angling so that they can meet the greater need of the village where they are located on an ongoing basis. I don't know if it's tentative or not, but that was my concluding analogy. Thank you.